Hey guys, welcome to Afternoon Read. Today we are going to read the first chapter of part one from Dark Lord by Jamie Thompson. And this is published by Scholastic Books. So we thank them for letting us uh, do this for you guys. Um, one thing that I want to point out before we start reading is this. It's a map. I love books that have maps in it. So that's really, that's really cool. Alright. So, chapter one of part one. The fall. This is exciting. His fall seemed to go on forever. It felt like bits of him were being stripped away, as as if he was changing into something else as he fell. After a long time, his cries of rage and fear faded, and he sank into a kind of sleep, all sensation lost, falling silently in an immense void of nothingness for what seemed like an eternity. Then, suddenly, crunch! Pain. So much pain. Then it faded away, and he took in a great shuddering gulp of air. He coughed and spat out a glob of black mucus. He watched as the mucus formed a small puddle of shiny black oil. He lay for a while, just breathing. The ground felt like hard gravel. He could barely move. He couldn't think properly, and he felt weak and listless. The sky above was blue. Painfully blue. He hated blue skies and sunlight. Ooh, he's edgy. He needed help. He called out for his lieutenant, Dread Gargan, hewer of limbs. But his voice caught in his throat. He tried again. Ah, Gargan, to me! He tried to bellow in his most commanding tones, but it only came out as a little squeak high-pitched and boyish. So it'd be more like, Gah! Gargan! To me! Like Skeletor. Where was the dark, imperious voice that sent forth his legions of dread to bloody war and pitiless plunder? He tried once more, but again it came out as a high-pitched trill. He groaned and tried raising his head, but couldn't. He wondered whether his helm of the hosts of Hades, okay, had slipped off again. If it wasn't balanced just right, it could catch his neck in an uncomfortable pinch. He reached up, but there was no helm at all. He couldn't fill any horns either, or knobby ridges of bone, only what seemed like a brown mop of hair on a rather small head. And his teeth! They didn't feel right either. No tusks or yellowed fangs to inspire terror and dread. Instead, his head felt like a little human head, just like the ones he usually kept impaled on those iron spikes over the gates of doom. Or the ones that Gargan wore hanging from his belt. Okay, fashion. What was going on? And where was Gargan? There was something else as well. Too much harsh sunlight usually fried his undead flesh like an egg in a pan, but he couldn't feel the usual sunfire burns. Not only that, the sky actually seemed rather beautiful. Aww. White clouds drifted serenely across the bright blue canopy of the heavens, and birds sang songs of joy in nearby trees. The sun warmed him nicely, and a feeling of, hmm, let's see now, something he hadn't felt in eons, a sense of peace came over him. Yes, that was it, a sense of peace. How could that be? He spent years trying to perfect a spell to cover the sky in the black vapors of gloom, but now the bright blueness didn't seem to bother him. A wash of pain came over him again. That's better, he thought. He didn't want to feel a sense of peace. It just wasn't the sort of thing he should be feeling. After all, 
he had his reputation to consider. With a great effort, he was able to turn his head a little and take his eyes off the sky. He saw a low building of dull gray stone on his left, squat and unsightly. Excellent. At least someone was making ugly stuff around here. Maybe it was of orcish design. You could always rely on orcs to make ugly stuff. He saw some kind of banner flying over the building. Runes were written on it in a strange language. To his surprise, he could read them. Save Mart Supermarket. It said, A market. Well, that didn't sound orcish. Orcs tended to prefer pillaging to shopping. And Save Mart. Was he uh, the local overlord, perhaps? Lord Save Mart, Smire of Foes, the pitiless one? Something about it didn't sound right. He looked the other way. What he saw was even stranger to his eyes. Several rows of oddly shaped metal boxes gleamed in the sunlight. There were all kinds of different colors, and glass plates had been set into their sides. They rested on four wheels, thickly encrusted with some kind of black resin that looked like the hard-set mucus of the giant spider beast of Scorpulus. One of the boxes suddenly shuddered to life, rattling away with a terrible noise like the coughing shriek of the dragon before it discharged its fiery breath. He tried to bend the box to his will. If it was a thing of evil, it should instinctively follow his command. Beast of still mucus, I command you in the name of the Dark Lord and by the power of the Nine Nether Worlds. But his voice came out as a querulous squeak. The metal box moved away, as if he hadn't even spoken. Then he noticed what looked like a human woman inside the box, peering out through glass panels. Of course, it was some kind of horseless chariot, driven no doubt by magic. The woman must be a potent witch indeed to command such a thing. The wizardry of mortals was getting sophisticated and powerful. He'd have to watch them more closely. Then he heard a voice, another human by the sound of it, shouting, Hey, you alright, son? His interest sharpened. A son's lifeblood would help him to perk up. He looked around for the boy the human was talking about, but couldn't see any children. Instead, he saw two men running toward him, both dressed in curious dark blue uniforms. They looked like a typical pair of ignorant, dumb as dormice human soldiers, though their uniforms didn't look very useful for war, and their caps wouldn't stop a sword or an axe, let alone a goblin pike or an orc arrow. He tried to laugh maniacally and tell the humans to flee for their lives or be utterly destroyed, but all that came out was a cough. <laughs> He tried unsuccessfully to sit up. He was still too weak. The human soldier stood over him. Surely his life couldn't end like this? Lying helpless, waiting to be killed by a couple of ordinary humans? But then an odd thing happened. One of the warriors bent down and cradled his head. Was he trying to help them? Better call an ambulance, Phil. The man who had spoken leaned closer, looking over him. Stupid human, didn't the fool realize who he was dealing with? Immediately, he tried ripping the man's throat out with his iron talon, gauntlets of intellectual destruction, but it was no good. He just didn't have the strength. Then he noticed he wasn't wearing any gauntlets, or even gloves. His hands were pink, pallid, and pudgy with neat little white nails, like those of a wretched little human boy. You can even rip out a throat of a rat with those hands, let alone a fully grown human warrior. He groaned in despair. The other human whispered something into a little black box attached to the front of his uniform. The little black box crackled, 
and spoke back to him. It must have some kind of sprite or minor demon bound into it to do his bidding. That would have taken powerful sorcery. Perhaps there were more than just ordinary human soldiers. Or, more likely, they served a mighty human wizard king. Maybe even the white wizard himself, Hasdrubin the Pure. Hmm. He'd have to bear that in mind. The human called Phil said, Okay, ambulance called in. The other one said, Don't worry, son, we're police officers. I'm Officer Smith. You can call me John. That's Officer Phil Johnson. The ambulance will be here soon. Take it easy. Best not to move until we know what's wrong with you. Well, the police officer was right. There certainly was something wrong with him. He couldn't move properly, even if he wanted to. And his body felt smaller than it should. The one called Phil said, Have you got a cell phone, son? We should call your mom and dad. He wants me to sell a phone? But what's a phone? What was this cretinous manling talking about? And what curious names? John? John the Smith? Had he made this strange black box in his blacksmithy? And Phil? Fill the land with their dead, fill your heart with hate? What did it mean? Either way, it was time they knew who was master here. He tried blasting them with the spell of agonizing obedience, but he couldn't shape his hands properly, or put the right syllables together. It was as if his tongue wouldn't obey him. He couldn't believe what was happening. Where were his powers of domination and destruction? What's that he's wrapped up in? said Officer Smith. I don't know, said Officer Johnson. Looks like some kind of oversized blanket. Black blanket, though? That's odd. All those weird, shiny patterns all over. Looks foreign. My nephew's got something like it. I think it's from some fantasy game or film, the wizards and dragons and stuff, said Officer Smith. His robes. So he was still wearing his cloak of endless night. Excellent. They didn't realize those weird, shiny patterns were blood glyphs of power. Each glyph was a mighty spell. Now he had them. He managed to crane his neck, focusing on one of the glyphs. It was the glyph of domination. All he had to do was read it out loud, and the creatures within a hundred mile radius would be his to command. But he couldn't read it. It didn't make any sense. It seemed completely meaningless. Why could he not understand the glyphs? After all, he had created them. Had they been stripped of their power somehow? What was happening? The humans were still blathering on blissfully, unaware of his attempts to destroy him. Does he speak English? What's your name, kid? asked Officer Johnson. The kid, for that's what he looked like, thought for a moment. He couldn't remember his name. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't. But he could remember what he was and his primary title. Da, cough, cough. <clears throat> I am the Dark Lord, he said. To his horror, he realized his voice really did sound like some kind of do-gooding elf woman or human boy child. Dirk? Did you say Dirk? No, 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 dark, dark lord. But his voice came out wrong, weak and raspy, and even more boyish than before. Dirk, eh? Dirk Lloyd? Well, where are your mom and dad, Dirk? Have you been hit by a car? Are you lost, son? My dad, he sputtered, outraged. I don't have parents, you curs. I am the incarnation of evil. The world burner, the dark one. To name a few of my titles, it's not, so I'm not someone's little boy, you fools. 
Oh, these computer games. It's an obsession at their age, said Officer Johnson. Do you know your address, Dirk? Can you tell us what happened? Not Dirk, Dark! My address is the Iron Tower of Despair beyond the Plains of Desolation in the Darklands, and I haven't been hit by a car. Uh, what is a car? The two police officers exchanged bemused glances. How come he doesn't know what a car is? Officer Smith asked. Unless maybe he was hit by one, and now he's suffering from some kind of post-traumatic stress. He's blocked out the memory of it all and taken on a, the personality of a video game character as a way to deal with it. Who knows? Yep. <sighs> Sounds like this one's for social services, that's for sure. I think they'll need a child psychologist as well, replied Johnson. As he said this, he pointed a finger to his own temple and moved it around in a circle as if he were drilling into his skull. Officer Smith nodded, but gestured with his eyes at Dirk. Not in front of the kid, he hissed. What? Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, oh, here comes the ambulance. A big, white, square, metal thing came hurtling toward them. Hardened mucus wheels of the spider beasts of Scorpulus spinning furiously. On top, some kind of elemental spirit of air had been magically bound into a glass container, and it was flashing bright red and shrieking in agony. Its cries of pain were so loud it hurt his ears. They were cruel, these humans, he thought. Even he, a dark lord, wouldn't torture an elemental like that. Unless he really had to. Or if it had wronged him in some way. Just wasn't an, an efficient way of doing things. The metal box pulled up beside them. The air elemental ceased its agonizing shrieking at last. Something like jaws opened at the back. Then a man and a woman dressed in dark green clothes came out, pulling a gurney between them. Ah, he thought to himself. They are doors, not jaws, of course. And the humans must be from some other branch of the humans' armed forces. They looked even less useful as soldiers than the men dressed in blue. What's your name, young man? said the woman breezily, obviously trying to go off an air of confident assurance. Aha, he thought. Perhaps she has an idea of who I am and is trying to cover up her fear. Then, one of the police officers said, His name's Dirk. Dirk Lloyd. He can't move, but we can't see anything wrong with him at all. And the boy can't seem to tell us either. No, not Dirk. It's dark, and I'm not a boy, said the boy desperately. But they didn't seem to take much notice of him. A wave of weakness came over him, and he sighed resignedly. Dirk it is, then, he thought to himself, for now until he got his powers back. Then they wouldn't know him by his full name and title. That was for sure. Okay, Dirk, we're gonna check you out, she said. She started poking him, pushing him here and there, lifting his eyelids and shining a bright light into his eyes. It was odd. Normally shining such a light into his eyes would burn the back of his brain like acid. Much the same as holy water being thrown into the face of a vampire. And yet, he felt nothing now. He heard the police officers talking with the man in green. They were mumbling things like post-traumatic stress, can't get anything out of him, claims to be from another world, some kind of disassociative personality disorder, seems physically fine except for the paralysis, and so on. It didn't make much sense to him, but it seemed kind of patronizing. He'd disassociate their bodies of their personalities if his powers were working, no question. Right, Dirk, we're gonna lift you up onto the stretcher. Everything's gonna be okay, said the woman. They lifted him with great care, which surprised him, because he expected to be roughly handled, if not killed outright. 
They loaded him into the back of the strange metal box they called the Ambulance. Could the military unit these green garb humans served be the Legion of the Knights of Ambu? Inside it was also white and very clean. The metallic smell and the hard steel racks reminded him of one of his torture chambers back home, despite the nasty clean whiteness of it all. Perhaps that was it. Perhaps they intended to torture him. He couldn't see any lances anywhere, though. Much less an Iron Maiden, Spiked Glove, or Stretching Rack. Pfft. Amateurs. The man, they called the ones dressed in green, paramedics, leaned over him with a painful-looking needle in his hand. Ah, yes. Torture it is, then, thought Dirk. Not exactly a lance, but just as agonizing if used in the right way. He strengthened his resolve. He was the Dark Lord, after all. And he wasn't going to break easily. I'm sorry, but we need to take some blood tests. It won't hurt. Much. The paramedic said. What kind of torture is it if it doesn't hurt much? But still, he didn't really want to be tortured. And what if it wasn't torture, but some kind of hideous magical device for the slaying of dark lords? Ooh. The paramedic brought the needle closer. Dirk saw a hollow space inside it. Could it be filled with clear liquid? Some kind of toxin, probably. Perhaps even water blessed at a sacred spring. Oh, by the nether gods, it would burn his undead veins like acid. Wait, he shouted. The paramedic paused. Don't worry, kid, it really doesn't hurt, he said. I'll give you power and wealth beyond anything you ever dreamed of, said Dirk. A province to govern armies, to command magic items and spells, whatever you want, just don't kill me. The man laughed out loud, as if it was all a joke, and leaned forward with the needle. Dirk managed to raise his hand to ward him off, and noticed that his ring of power was still on his finger. Even though the hand was small, pallid and dumpy, he still had his ring. He tried to smear the paramedic across one wall of the vehicle, using a blast of ravening flame from the ring, but nothing happened. He looked at the ring closely. Normally, mighty runes writhed and coruscated continuously around it, but now the runes were dull and lifeless. It looked more like a simple band of drab gray lead than a ring of power. This was the last straw for Dirk. He had invested most of his ancient power and might gathered over millennia of magical research into that ring, and it was all gone. His great ring was worthless, along with his robes and all his spells. How far the mighty had fallen. Then the paramedic stuck the needle into his arm. A minor prick of almost complete insignificance compared to the full realization of his loss. Anyway, it didn't seem like torture, and it certainly wasn't life threatening. But then he noticed they were draining some of his blood away. Of course. It wasn't about torture or death. It was about power. They were after his blood for themselves, cursed them all. Who knew what kind of mighty potions, demon summonings, and black magics could be wrought with the blood of a, the Dark Lord? And he was powerless to do anything about it. He glared at the two paramedics bayfully. They just smiled back at him inanely every now and then muttering platitudes like, there, there, or everything will be okay, or we really ought to tell your parents, can you remember where they are? Fools. If only they knew how close they had come to total subjugation in the slave pits of never-ending toil. The ambulance hurtled along at quite a high speed. Dirk began to realize that it was actually some kind of machine. 
possibly not even powered by magic at all. A remarkable feat of engineering. He vowed to have a look into this technology when he had a chance. Extraordinary sights greeted him as he looked out the windows. Stone buildings, paved roads, hundreds of these chariot machines rushing around everywhere. The gigantic buzzing steel beetles, tall poles with what looked like magical lanterns hanging from them, and people. People all over the place. This world was awash with humans, like some kind of plague! He'd have to do something to reduce their numbers. Yes, that would be fun. Still, he'd have to be careful. It wasn't going to be easy to conquer this land, as he thought. These humans had learned to harness the powers of nature in ways he'd never imagined. The city was huge, a sprawling warren of rock and iron, and so many... What did they call them? Stores. That was it. Stores. And also what looked like signs. All over the place, with strange red or black symbols on them. Some with just numbers. What did it all mean? He began to feel very tired, and he dozed off. He dreamed of world domination. Meanwhile, back in the car parking space, the boy had fallen into a black blob of mucus spread out slowly to form a dark patch on the ground, like a small oil slick. All right, well, that was chapter one of part one of Dark Lord by Jamie Thompson. So we will do chapter two of part one next Wednesday, and we'll see you there. Bye.